Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Chris Salter, an artist and professor for computation art and research chair in new media technology and the senses at Concordia University in Montreal. Chris's work explores the borders between the senses, art, design, and new technologies through large-scale installations as well as books and lectures all over the world. He is the author of two books for MIT Press, Entangled, Technology and the Transformation of Performance, and Alien Agency, Experimental Encounters with Art in the Making. Welcome to Technoculture, Chris, and I would like to start by asking you something that has to do with art and science. So for the podcast, but also for my research work, I speak to uh, many artists, as well as scientists and researchers, as well as people who are used to transitioning from one domain to the other or work at the edge of these two. And I'm supposed to be a hybrid profile myself. So I think about art and science and how all of this is either different or comes together. I'm involved in the current discourse of art and science. When I first learned about you, I saw keywords that I was familiar with, attributed to you and your work, but there seemed to be something very unique in the way you embodied them, and I got very interested in uh, your work, and especially your intellectual work, so that's why I invited you on the podcast, and I would like to have your take on art and science, and more precisely, the encounter of these two, which sometimes is portrayed today like something new, and yet we all know it's not new. But what is new about it? Because other conditions in the environment have changed. So is there something new? Can you help me separate the wheat from the chaff and see what is good or probably useful in this concept and what is void what is just rhetoric, so what we can leave behind. But I wouldn't dismiss the whole thing. I feel that there's something about it. So please, what is your take on this new couple, art and science? So, okay, so I guess, you know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons. There's all sorts of historical reasons. As you say, art and science is not a new thing. In fact, um, it goes way, way back. It's just the understanding, actually what's radically changed is not only the understanding of science from the Renaissance onwards, but also the understanding of art. Um, the concept of art we have now has really nothing to do with um, the concept of art that emerges from the Greeks, of course, which is usually called techne, uh, or the Romans, which is called ars. Um, um, the idea we have of the arts now is a romantic idea from the late 19th, the mid 19th century or, or early 19th century uh, about individual um, aesthetic expression uh, in, embodied in a person. Um, that was not the case uh, within the so-called liberal arts, the arts liberales in the Middle Ages or all the way up until the post-Renaissance, nor was it part of the so arts uh, mechanic, mechanicae, which were basically the mechanical arts. So the arts liberales, of course, were kind of part of the quadrivium, which was geometry, um, uh, music, uh, uh, astronomy, uh, and um, mathematics. Uh, and then the so-called the, the so-called like mechanical arts were things like uh, cooking and architecture, like, like practical arts, you know. So this this debate about art and science is is a long ranging one. In fact, art and science were much closer. Uh, as forms of kind of speculation um, in the post-Renaissance period of the 17th century, for instance, with, with Diderot or de Lambert's encyclopedia, they tried to kind of bring these things together. Our understanding of art, though, really derives from, the, from as I said, the 19th century when basically the fine arts developed, and there was a split. There was a split between the fine arts, there was a split between what we called science, which basically became the predominant field of knowledge making, and at the same time, uh, the field of what we called applied science, which eventually in the 1920s or 1930s became attached with the term technology. Actually, it's a very recent term as well. Um, 
one of the one of the so so you know this is a long running debate and and even though people think it's new art science the newness of it comes from basically the institutionalization of that of those terms within let's say the kind of um I mean, for, for loss of a better word, neoliberal construction of institutions like universities and research contexts that have been going on now since the 1980s, but of course had already their roots in, 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 in earlier periods. So the, the, the thing about when we talk about art and science is that um, there is no art and there is no science. There are only arts and sciences. And what the art, art and sciences assumes is an old, um, paradigm which has been critiqued by sociologists of science uh, and philosophers of science for quite some time, for actually the last 40 years, which is the idea of unity, that there is a unified notion of a discipline, that the sciences are unified based on some concept of scientific method, which has been disproven again and again and again. Usually scientific method is this idea of deduction, right, that you have a theory and then you do experiments to prove the theory or a hypothesis and you use those experiments to kind of prove or disprove your hypothesis. But that's been countlessly debated um, from Feyerabend and, and Poliani and Thomas Kuhn and all these classic historians of science or philosophers of science. Um, so the unity of the arts and the unity, the unity of art and unity of science don't exist. Those are, those are fictions that have been brought about um, by institutional prerogatives and by, let's say, debates that go back to questions of objectivism in the sciences. And, and the other thing you have to understand, too, is that this um, interdisciplinary connection between arts and the university or the research context is something which has all sorts of different historical trajectories. Uh, in Europe, for instance, there is still a strong separation in France uh, and, and also in Germany um, in the between the Beaux Arts model and and the universities, or between the Hochschule, which is no longer called Hochschule, it's called Universität in Germany, but the the art and design schools, in the university, you know, so the tradition that university was a place of knowledge making, right? Which and knowledge making was textual knowledge. So the 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 sciences existed in the universities, not just the uh, the, the uh, uh, natural sciences, but also the human and the social sciences, you know, right? So. So whereas practice happened in the art and design schools, and, 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 and that was never seen as science, that was seen as practical knowledge, right? And so that's, that discussion already is set up by institutional structures that emerge in, in Europe um, in, when the research university emerges, which is again in the University of Berlin, in the 19th century. Um, in North America, let's say post the 1960s, um, university uh, arts programs had traditionally already been embedded within universities, within so-called liberal arts universities, because art was seen as part of the liberal arts, was seen as a kind of branch of the humanities. Um, and so, you know, th this, this debate already has a different valence in, in North America than it does in Europe. And in, for instance, in Quebec, where, where I'm based, it goes even further back. And it's tied to a really specific set of political social circumstances, which is the development of the so-called quiet revolution in the 1960s, where um, the province of Quebec uh, tried to, and the, the francophone uh, um, population of Quebec tried to reassert its, its presence uh, against the authority of the Catholic Church. And at that time, basically, they tried to build a new kind of civil society based on this francophone uh, context, you know. And what happened there was um, there were big debates about the position of the art schools in relationship to the universities. Eventually, those art schools were embedded into universities, um, but not because of some kind of model like in Europe, like the Bologna process, but simply because um, the um, as part of this social revolution and democratic transformation in Quebec, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 art, the artists, uh, and, and actually the, the, the government saw the necessity of creating a continuous, uh, education of the populace, uh, from kindergarten to the university in the arts, because they felt that was part of a democratic, it was a modernist concept, of course, part of a democratic, um, uh, you know, fundamental part of democratic, uh, secular society. So in fact, 
Um, already in the late 1960s, when, for instance, the University of Quebec at Montreal, UCAM, uh, had one of the first programs, graduate programs in Ars Pratique, which was in a university, I think in the French university system, um, already the debate started about the nature of artistic practice within a knowledge producing context, which is the university itself. And so it's very interesting because those debates were not tied to bureaucratic initiatives like the Bologna process of trying to standardize universities across, for instance, Europe. Uh, and so like uh, art and design schools would have to become research institutes because they would have to be on the same equivalent across each country. It was actually based on kind of more fundamental um, social political questions about what constitutes a democratic society and how, what role do the arts play in that. So already the debates were going on about what is the role of practice in everyday life that is, that emerges from artistic context and what actually is um, the role of practice within the knowledge construction um, uh, uh, framework, right? And so now it took 50 years um, before formalized funding programs were set up in Quebec. Uh, the so-called, uh, uh, what we call research creation or recherche creation. Um, it took until the beginnings of the 2000s to actually implement um, funding for artists who were working as university researchers. Uh, and that has a long its own trajectory. Um, it basically had a lot to do with the fact that even though artists were in universities, they uh, uh, were not able to get the same fun funding possibilities uh, that their colleagues in the social science humanities and natural sciences were receiving. So in fact, there were many commissions as Quebec has this tradition of setting up commissions um, to study the problem and then to pro pro provide recommendations to the government. And um, one of the early commissions that happened in the 1990s was very much about trying to like, right the wrongs of these university artist creators who were unfortunately um, not receiving uh, funding, even though they were seen as providing the same kinds of so-called services uh, that their colleagues were, training of students, creating new, new knowledge, creating new research, um, and, and, and say putting that out into either peer-reviewed publics or the, general, uh, or the general public. So the, the thing is, is these, these are all really specific historical um, uh, um, contextual discussions uh, and it doesn't help to create this general concept that, you know, oh, you know, there's art and science and there's research creation. They all come from highly specific uh, social, uh, political, and economic uh, contexts. Is epistemology a good access key to this problem? To ask, does research produce knowledge? Does art only produce pretty things or does art produce knowledge too? And if so, what kind? So is epistemology a good angle to look at the question and build a discussion over whether art and science are different or why they should be together? Well, the debates about epistemology uh, only happen in the universities that don't happen with artists. I don't think of, I don't know of any artist who thinks about their work creating knowledge in the sense of how universities see knowledge, which is durable, repeatable, circulatable knowledge. And in fact, I just had a discussion with my methods class yesterday about this very fact. Um, and it's really interesting because, um, you know, uh, if you're if uh, if you're creating art within a research context. Um, it's not enough to create the object, right? It's all, what, what's demanded is not only the object, but a discursive um, apparatus that uh, is entangled um, with the object and the and a broader, uh, broader questions, you know? So there's, you know, there's long debates. Uh, James Elkins, for instance, brings this up, up a lot of times about, you know, where does the knowledge lie? Does it lie in the object, in the experience of the artwork? Does it lie in the writing about the artwork? Does it lie in a, in a, in a kind of um, triangulation between discourse, uh, uh, audience, and pu uh, uh, public and, and, and object? I mean, these are, these are all long, long debates. Um, it's really interesting because in the science, social study of science and technology, or STS, 
you know, the early debates were about the sociology of scientific knowledge, how science produces knowledge, and what forms of knowledge does it produce, and, you know, is that knowledge tacit, is it, is it inductive, is it deductive, all, all of these classic questions. Well, um, but then, of course, a lot of, and, and, and of course, in the 1980s and 1990s, after people like Bruno Latour uh, and Andrew Pickering and uh, Sharon Travick and Joan Fujimura and uh, Karen Norsatina all did studies in the lab in laboratories, um, they started to be ask a different kind of question. They say, well, not necessarily is the knowledge human knowledge, but what is the relationship between forms of material knowing and material practice in which um, – you know, theories and concepts were somehow um, put more in their place. And in fact, the study became about instruments, about infrastructures, about conditions in, in laboratories, and how those aided in the called, so-called production of knowledge or facts or scientific concepts. You have a very similar thing that happens in the arts, where you have the same kinds of apparatuses um, infrastructures, instruments, and but they have a very different purpose. Uh, and I think one of the one of the things about epistemology uh, is that it's tied to, uh, let's say, the concept of truth construction, right? It's like that knowledge, scientific facts, if they're validated by numbers of researchers, um, and they essentially become a fact that they then attend to a notion of truth-making. Um, the arts are not about the production of truth. They're about the production of perhaps, um, let's say, uh, um, uh, as, 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 as Felix Guattari says, you know, decentering uh, de de the real or breaking off a part of the real. Uh, and so that one is, as a subject or an experiencer, is, is, is brought into a, other kind of um, relationship with the world. Now, I think that you know, in an in an in a, in an one of so in a, in a university kind of context, it's like when you're creating artistic work, part of your the, your the need to do that is to contextualize that work. You know, now in the in the art world, contextualization happens in. In, in it also, but it happens in different ways. It may happen curatorially, so the curator takes the voice of the artist. It may happen when artists who actually write artist statements, but those artist statements are more about what, how the work came into the world based on that artist's personal experience. And, and of course, that personal experience is filtered by all sorts of interests in political, aesthetic, cultural questions. Um, but there's not a need to demonstrate that the work is situated um, within either a canon of existing works or existing knowledge, uh, there's no need to cite it. You don't see exhibitions in which the works are footnoted uh, to other works. Um, so the whole process of knowledge validation is very, very, very different. Um, and so epistemology uh, may be useful in trying to understand how a work is situated within a certain domain of practices or histories or theoretical concepts or literature or whatever you want to say, um, that doesn't necessarily guarantee um, the success of the artwork, nor does it guarantee uh, the material conditions that may make the artwork possible. Uh, it just asserts that one understands the work's relationship to a broader context, you know. And and another interesting thing I just talked about this yesterday too is so in you know well known book by um, in in history of science by uh, Steve Chapin and Simon Schaefer called Leviathan and the Air Pump. Um, they they talk about like where does this idea of object? It, it, this is a book about the relationship between Thomas Hobbes and Robert Boyle, um, both scientists, both with different ways of trying to construct apparatuses to um, either justify the existence of scientific knowledge or scientific facts. And what's interesting in the in the in the eighteenth century, what's really interesting is that um, they give a reason why we have this notion of objectivity. You know, it's, again, this is assumption that science is objective. 
and the arts are subjective. Well, that's been critiqued as well, that kind of dichotomy for many, many years. And, and one of the reasons that, but the question is, why does the subjectivity thing come? Is, is, is it somehow given in the sciences? Don't forget the sciences up until the bureaucratization of research with the University of Berlin, um, the sciences were individual practices. People had individual labs, you know, they weren't not institutional context like we have now, which are supported by governments or supported by, uh, um, you know, forms of kind of bureaucratic um, financialization. And, and so, so, uh, so what they basically say is that um, when Robert Boyle was doing an experiment, building an air pump, um, a vacuum to try to demonstrate certain scientific principle about about uh, the, about the existence of a vacuum. That he he engaged in three different kinds of technologies. One of them he engaged with technical instruments, right? So he had to build an apparatus to demonstrate his uh, concept, right? But the second thing is is that when that apparatus was built, it was then shown uh, in 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 the Royal Society. But not everyone could travel to the London to the Royal Society to see the demonstration. So what does Boyle do? Well, he needs to create so-called um, reports. So he has a technology of uh, a literary technology, the technology of writing. And so in the report, the idea is that you want to be uh, as impartial as an observer as you can and to describe basically what you observe, right? So you can't embellish that observation with fact, with, with opinions or biases or this kind of thing. So in fact, the report becomes the durable knowledge for those who cannot be present. It becomes a kind of de facto witness. Whereas then you also have to have physical witnesses. So this is a social technology, which is what they argue. And the social technology is that impartial scientists should be present, the ones who can be present, um, to witness the experiment and then to report it to others. Well, again, what you want is you want somebody who's not, whose biases, um, and this is what we call peers, right? Whose biases will not necessarily change the, the course of the research. But in fact, those peers can say to other peers, well, I saw this, this is what happened. Um, this proves this or this proves that. And so you don't want the social bias of the observer to enter into the picture. For instance, you don't, you want to make sure they're impartial, that they're so-called at arm's length. I mean, all the things we try to describe about peers, right? And so what's really interesting is that objectivity is again, a social, technical, literary phenomenon, according to them in the sciences. It's not some given thing that science is somehow privileged to have objective knowledge that is provable while, you know, we say the arts are subjective. And, and of course, you know, Feyerabend and Against Method says the same thing. He says, why is science, there is no scientific method. You know, science grab, the most innovative science is that which grabs onto whatever it can, um, be it um, other disciplines or even other kinds of social means. Like when, when Feyerabend talks about Galileo, Galileo's use of the telescope was not just like, he just didn't just discover the heliocentric vision of the world. He actually had to work with a telescope. He didn't understand it. It produced all sorts of false images and false information. So he had to persuade people. He had to use rhetoric. He had to, you know, so all of these things play into the scientific worldview. It's not simply that facts emerge out of nature and then they're simply, you know, given. Um, all of these social and political and technical um, um, forces are operating uh, together. And, and of course, that's very, very similar to how the arts work as well. I like that you're exposing some of the preconceptions I might have, partially that I'm aware of, but that I cannot break free from um, by myself. So I'm liking this. I will keep asking you about this for, for a moment if you bear with me. I think that my ideas, my definitions of research, art, science, knowledge are pretty conventional because I'm a product of this academic system. Even if my personality or my interest, my instinct call for a broader vision. So when I'm asked to make a case for art and science. I know that I'm not very good at it. I know that I oppose some resistance. Still, something does not convince me. And I will try to give you two simple images and ask you to put them together for me. So these two images are that of a scientist and that of an artist. And they are extremely cliché. 
symptomatic of some unsophisticated thinking I'm having here, but nonetheless, I think compatible with at least a definition of science and a definition of art. The scientist is somebody who is writing a bunch of numbers down because he or she is a uh, go figure. I imagine it, the scientist is a he just to complete the cliche, okay? Uh, measurements. Measurements concerning something like a physical phenomenon. So it's important, I think, that when we think of science in this context, we understand exact science. Nat- sciences. Yeah, natural sciences. So even I am labeled as a researcher, but I really think it's inaccurate. I think that what I do is intellectual work. Right. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't have rigor. But when we oppose art and science, I think it's important to be clear about the fact that we mean natural sciences. So measurements, some phenomenon. We want to find out how something works, how something is. And then when that's done, we derive uh, an abstract conclusion. The, the process seems pretty impersonal. Not necessarily, I mean, I don't want to say objective, but too, it aims to be, but impersonal because mm-hmm. what the scientist thinks in that moment is not really relevant. It's numbers. You measure, write it down. Uh, And then when you have your conclusion, you write a scientific paper, and that is knowledge. On the other side, you have an artist, somebody painting or repainting. For example, it can even be a piece of furniture, some historical wooden cabinet decorated. And so it takes skills to do it. And there is an aesthetic element to it. It's a very practical type of activity. That person is not looking for anything. It's just a doing. So provided these two cliché images are very cliché, I think that they are compatible with at least a definition of scientist and artist. So I fail to see how one of the two would benefit from talking to the other about what they're doing or how we would benefit from bringing the activities they do closer together, if not merging them, depends what people mean by art science. So since you are a scientist, a scholar, and you're also an artist, can you bring these two images together in a way that makes sense to me, please? (laughs) Um, Well, you know, again, the term scientist... Uh, is is a European use of the term. So I actually never call myself a scientist. Um, um, I, you know, labels are always tricky. So the interesting thing about researcher, creator, which is the term, it depends on what context I'm in, actually, to use these terms. Um, researcher, creator is very interesting because it doesn't necessarily imply you're making art. Now, the assumption is usually that artists are the researcher creators. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be. What it does mean in, in the Quebec context is that there is actually a, um, an ongoing, sustained investigation um, creatively of a particular question or issue or problematization is the term that the Fonds de Recherche de Quebec uses, which is a very interesting term because, of course, for Foucault, problematization is a concept in, by which one um, understands the kind of epistemic um, frameworks of which forms of type, certain forms of knowledge emerge and others don't, right? So I, so I, I, you know, I first always say I'm an artist and I'm a scholar, you know, Um, and, and from, you know, so of course scholarship is of course also, you may tie under research uh, but of course, it's a more human humanities-based understanding. It means there's a kind of written um, frame of how you how you, you pass that knowledge around. I would I would say, um, you know, that I I I, 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 I that for, for me the relationship between writing, making, and 
thinking about things are are, are all entangled together. Um, and I do all three things um, because they somehow inform each other. And that may be different than other other people. So um, so I'm making work and um, which involves, you know, uh, I mean, my, my, my work is, is complex um, in the sense that it, it involves many different practices and disciplines uh, and, uh, and techniques uh, and contexts and, and, uh, and demands different, let's say, sites by which it takes place. It moves between uh, the university milieu in which I'm based. It then goes into the cultural sector. It then moves in. Sometimes it moves in policy context. Sometimes it moves in commercial context. Uh, it moves in in cultural institutions. I mean, it's so it's it's shifting all the time, you know. And I don't mean just like an artwork gets shown in those places, but the the concepts or the knowing or the ideas or the techniques or the instruments that emerge from those projects have their own lives um, that are not necessarily tied to the individual artwork. Uh, so. You know, and and to me, they're all part of one larger kinds of picture, which is, um, you know, how cre making something, um, let's say, sh you know, shifts the the balance of um, experience and and knowing, you know, um, about uh, and knowing one's position in, in the world and one's position in relationship to other others' positions. Um, so, you know. I mean, art, because I because I come from the theater uh, artistically and from music. Um, I mean, the theater is a social thing anyway. It's a social context. It's not. I don't come from the training in the visual arts of being in an atelier and working alone and you know uh, going in the studio each day. I come from a model in which. Um, you know, a group of people come together that have different practices and different disciplines, and they work together to make something that's greater than any one person in that team. And so it's natural that I can, or just natural, I mean, it's just, I just understand the context by which I can go back and forth um, between, you know, uh, a group, bringing a group of people together from, from different disciplines and practices, uh, working on a kind of boundary object together, making it work, touring that work, talking about it, uh, spinning off a technology, uh, putting that into uh, a, a other kinds of contexts. I think it's, it's just something I just am used to doing, and I've done it for a long, long, long time, being both inside the university, but also being trained outside in the professional performance uh, world. Um, so it, it's it's just somehow something I'm used to. It's not necessarily a model that everyone can follow because, you know, I have a kind of strange background. And I think also part of it comes from the fact that I'm actually trained in four things. I'm trained in the humanities, the social sciences, the arts, and technology. So I understand colleagues on the other side of the fence who don't want to compare their books to someone making a sculpture because they think, you know, those are totally like apples and oranges. I understand the question of like why methods have to be justified. I understand, you know, I, and at the same time, I also understand like the, the kind of anarchy, the, the, like Fire Robin says, kind of epistemological anarchy that, that artists bring, which is uh, forms of resistance and forms of um, not wanting to buy into standards and forms of measurement and norms, basically. So I guess, you know, my training, my training is really kind of weird and, hybrid from the start um and i just i think it's also i'm very curious about many different fields and how those fields uh, can intersect both in let's say uh discursive ways but also in 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 in, in experiential ways you know, I think that I shouldn't share this thought if I wanted to come across like super progressive but i admit that i find some resistance for the image you just proposed of equating the book and the sculpture at some level, because I feel that there is a difference even when I do my research work, uh, especially in collaboration with the chemists for my magnetic tapes and that type of work or this podcast. There is that element 
of subjectivity to me. And I wish that I told you that I understand everything you say and your ideas are so ahead and I'm on board, but I didn't think this through, by the way. I'm just saying I find myself in favor of the book. I don't know why. Maybe I could change my mind very easily. Yeah, you know, I, I just don't find the discussion between subjectivity and objectivity very useful because, as I said, those are highly historically contingent concepts. Because as a scientist, uh, I'm sorry, as a, as, a, as a natural scientist, as a social scientist, you are already setting up the conditions of the experiment um, in ways to try to prove or to get what you want to get out of it, right? You, you're already setting up the frame um, of the context that you are trying to prove uh, or disprove. And of course, the debate about falsification is you know, is, in, in sciences is, is have now been critiqued endlessly, you know, that, that in fact, you can't prove it's true, but you can prove it's false. But as I said, the, the, the arts, so the arts the discussion is not about subjectivity because the sciences, I mean, my colleagues who work in, let's say, cultural studies or philosophy, uh, that's just as objective as artistic practice, you know, believing, believing in affect, the models of affect in against hermeneutics, for instance, is a very subjective process, right? How, do, how does the philosopher prove the objectivity of their theories? They don't. So do you say philosophy, which is seen as the pre preeminent, you know, love of wisdom, right, from the Greek, um, how is philosophy more objective than, say, political science? So objectivity, of course, comes from when we start to bring in standards of measurement into processes. When we start to say, all right, we're going to use this tool, which will guarantee these kinds of results, and we're going to use this tool to, to measure these phenomena, and then we're going to be able to measure those phenomena in, the same, in a different lab, in a different setting, and then we start to look at these things. So in terms of quantitative, so you know, if we look at quantitative and qualitative ways of knowing things, um, that's perhaps more, uh, you might say, yes, the sciences may be predominated um, uh, it may be predominantly driven by quantitative forms of knowing um, because certain many scientific, natural scientific phenomena um, have to be measured in that way in order to compare them, right? So the ideas of comparison and measurement come hand in hand, um, whereas uh, uh, qualitative uh, ways of knowing things from everything from, you know, ethnography, which is a highly subjective process, even though people like Malinowski try to claim, you know, that it has a kind of scientific basis because the anthropologist who goes in the field has pr knowledge that others don't have in terms of being able to schematize concepts, being able to speak certain native languages, uh, and so on. That's also been highly critiqued, that the anthropologist brings, of course, their own uh, biases um, into the field with them. They don't eliminate them by uh, by doing the field work. Um, so I, I, I don't I don't and 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 the arts again. Like what arts are we talking about? For instance, there are projects I've done that have resulted in installations like Haptic Field, in which we started out by doing quantitative research on measuring uh, just noticeable differences of lab subjects being able to perceive touch. And someone wrote about that in not I, not me, but one of the artists or one of the the the, 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 the um, music technologist students who were working on the project. And so that was actually quite important to be able to analyze those different J and Ds and to say, oh, actually, you don't need a hundred, you know, uh, uh, um, tactile transducers on the body because we tend to interpolate the skin interpolates between this and this. So. You know, now that led, that fed a different process. That was work that was not, the work was, that was only a part of the work, right? Whereas in the sciences, that becomes the work. If I can prove in a research paper that, you know, we, we don't, we, you know, we can interpolate between point numbers of, of, of differences of points on the skin in terms of haptic information, then and we try to kind of compare what people have done before and address the gap, blah, 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 the classic kind of research thing. So, I, you know, those, there's no um, reason why in an artistic process the kind of rigor of quantification uh, 
and uh, as also qualification cannot be played together hand in hand. There's an assumption, the, the, the problem comes in the assumption, and it's not just in the sciences, it's also highly, in fact, I think the sciences many times are more friendly with the arts than the social science and the humanities are because they're competing for the same amounts of money. Uh, as a you know, as a kind of in, within the university kind of ecology of funding, um, but uh, you know, th this idea that that artwork is a subjective thing which comes from the artist's you know uh, uh, own experience and has no durable connection to anything is a is also a very romantic idea of art that is carried on by the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. If as some colleagues of mine start seeing, uh, especially those in science and technology studies, they start to see that in fact, the production of artistic works within kind of techno-scientific contexts is as rigorous and as complex as the production of scientific knowledge uh, in the natural sciences. Um, they see that in fact, um, these old ideas about art is subjective and the science is objective fall apart very quickly. So when you make an installation, are you trying to convey a message? Are you trying to say something? So is art a language, a form of communication? Where I'm going with this is that I would say the scientist is not trying to say anything. So the, the subject, the person, doesn't have a voice. And I'm so sorry to keep defending this subjectivity thing, but I want to get it out of myself and I keep finding objections. So I just show them to you so you can actually help me move forward. Well, again, like this, the, the sci like as Latour says, the scientist uh, takes all of the messiness of the laboratory and converts it into inscriptions, right? So in fact, the graph, the number, the text stands in as the witness for the scientist's own, you know, subjective sense of the experiment, right? It's just the scientist uses, uh, and of course, it depends on what we're talking about, communication. I, I don't see art as, yes, you want to communicate the sense that you want people to, um, this is very different, again, like it depends on the artist you're talking about. Some artists could care less about their audiences. Other artists um, who make work in which the, their work is dependent on the audience are highly interested in making sure that uh, audiences are um, compelled, are caught, um, or uh, uh, communicated to. And I don't. I don't talk about art is not communicating a message. You know, this is not this is not information theory. <clears throat> uh, it's not a sender and receiver model of 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 um, of the, the aesthetic. Um, so, so you know, I don't think art has a message. Oh, please tell me more. Tell me more. What does it do then? How? What is it about? What? Well, again, this is a highly it, it's a it's a highly um, contextual question. Which art artists are we talking about? I mean, again, like this is what's interesting to me and why I've done so much research in sociology of science is that no sociologist or anthropologist would make a general claim uh, about, for instance, science. Um, without actually seeing the particularities of practices operating. So when Nora Satina in you know, her work on epistemic cultures says, uh, let's look at the physics, let's look at the particle physics um, culture, the so-called epistemic culture, the knowledge culture, and then let's look at the molecular biology culture in, in for instance, the Max Planck Institute in Germany, you know, a very specific also research context. And she says, you know, these are, these are very different cultures, you know, the collaboration of the physicists who are only using forms of representation like screens um, and computers to tell them something about phenomena they cannot even Im imagine or experience, uh, write papers that have thousands of authors. And so, in fact, the notion of collaboration is completely different. <clears throat> Whereas in molecular biology, she claims, you know, so that, you know, scientists are, are like caring for things like gardening, you know, so they're caring for their specimens and they're carrying them from one thing to another and they're changing context all the time. Um, and that's work at the bench, which is highly um, tac tactile, for instance. And that's a very, <clears throat> it's a very, very specific thing. So even if we say the digital arts, which I hate as a, as a term, um, the way in which I make things and the way in which an artist not in the university or an artist even in the university makes things are completely different because, you know, 
the way you set up a laboratory, the way you uh, hire students or collaborators, what you look for. I mean, all of these things have a much closer relationship to the sciences than people imagine they have to the arts. You know, as I said, it has to do with this romantic idea of what art is from the sciences and vice versa, this romantic idea of what science is from the arts, you know. Um, if artists ever went into scientific laboratories, they would see lots of similarities to what they do and lots of discrepancies. And it's the same with the scientists. They go into the artist's studio, and of course the studio and the lab is always mixed together, but they're actually quite different environments, depending again on where you are contextually. Um, they would also be surprised if, 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 uh, if an engineer came into my, um, now of course engineering is a bit complicated because art engineering is a tech is a practical art in some ways. It's a technical art, you know, it, it has a strange relationship to research in the universities anyway, but if computer scientists who was interested in, for instance, artificial intelligence, uh, and different applications that might come into my lab and see us in our discussions about how to use machine learning to affect people's perception of time. Um, or to think about like how machine learning uh, could be, um, uh, let's say, staged so one sees the trial and error of a neural network doing gradient descent, and that's that's uh, let's say uh, displayed in some kind of perceptually perceivable thing like light or sound or something. I'm sure they would find a lot of similarities to what they do. It's just the outcome is different, and the me and the objectives are different. So you might say that like laboratories and studios have similarities in their setup and their frameworks and all of this, but in fact the 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 the, the means and the ends are, are are really different, you know. And so I guess you would say like that. What is the artist trying to do? Artists are trying to produce um, forms of of experience or knowing which actually don't operate within um, normative context or normative frameworks. And I mean normative in the sense of perceptual, social, political, economic, or so and so. So, you know, so they can operate in many different ways. They operate as forms of communication. They operate as forms of, of defamiliarization. They operate as forms of debate. Um, they operate as concepts. Uh, there are many, many, many different um, uh, ways in which uh, artistic works um, are, um, you know, uh, produced in the, and the kinds of, um, let's say the kind of attractors of, of reception that they, they invite. Um, I mean, in, in my own work, I'm, I'm not, I'm interested in, in, in constructing apparatuses in which certain types of forms of experience may be catalyzed by those. And, and, and those are really specific to things like sensory experiences, like how do we shift away from thinking about, um, for instance, uh, vision being the dominant sense, which of course it's not, but, um, uh, but you know, our culture uh, tells us many times otherwise. Um, how, how do, um, how do we relate to forms of different forms of time that, that emerge, um, in experience? What is the relationship to, uh, an apparatus, uh, and our self, you know, uh, and our, our notions of self, you know, is that a fixed concept? And in fact, you find lots of neuroscientists talking about the same thing, the self that's, that's actually not a, there is no, there is no defined point of self in the brain, right? If we believe in the connectionist model, we believe in the, or, uh, you know, the kind of, let's say emergent frameworks of ensembles of complex groupings of neurons that come together and form synchrony patterns for cognitive acts and then kind of dissipate back into noise. There is no position where is the self there, you know? So in fact, the question that motivates some cognitive scientists or some neuroscientists, not all, but small and growing fraction of them, um, is a very similar question to, you know, how, uh, why, why an artistic work might provoke that. But Ultimately, artistic work is an experience, and, and, and I think it's defined differently than, for instance, reading something, because by going into something with your body, um, you encounter a different worldview, you know, um, than simply standing back and looking uh, or reading. Um, you are in a different register of, of perception. Um, 
and uh, making sense in, in, in many ways, you know? And um, that's why the material aspects of creation are so important because, you know, it's one thing to have a debate about artificial intelligence. It's another thing to walk into something and encounter it directly, either at your own body scale or at a scale that dwarfs you. And then you suddenly go, hmm, well, what's that? Is this the, is this the future? Am I suddenly in the future? Is my body in the future? You know, so it suddenly creates a kind of debate, which is, I think, um, only possible by that kind of direct, you know, sensory motor, um, encounter. I would like to ask you something about your artistic work. Not because I ran out of questions on the topics we just discussed. I could literally listen to you all day. But I want to make sure before the time is up that I get to ask you something about your installations, which are the reason why I got in touch with you last year in 2017. And the reason why I traveled to Berlin and then to Montreal to see some of these works. Immersive and multisensory installations. They challenge human perception by merging haptic, this would be touch, visual, acoustic, and other sensory phenomena. So it is about the human senses and computing. But on the other hand, you also experiment with the non-human. You collaborate with biologists and basically experiment with life engineering, living cells. There's this concept of the living machine and ecosystems. So basically life, but non-human. How does that end up in an artistic installation? And also what ties together working with the human and the non-human in the light of this concept of agency, which you explore in your book from 2015, Alien Agency. What has agency here and how is that agency exercised? Well, it's, it's carbon things that have agency, but also non-carbon things also. I mean, you know, uh, the word agency is so messy. I mean, uh, let's just say, you know, there's different types of um, energies or forces in, in all sorts of stuff, right? And so, uh, yes, the senses are human because I, I'm still actually making art for human beings. I know artists want to make art for animals and, you know, insects and things like that, but you know, I think there's a certain presumption about, I think there's a, a bit too much of a presumption about taking theoretical ideas of, of uh, Donna Haraway and trying to apply them to everything you do. So, <laughs> but anyway, so, sorry. So, so yeah, so the sensory, the sensory versus the kind of non-human, let's say. And what ties these two things together? Or are they two different focuses of your work now? Or there is a common denominator. Is it life? But how? Sure. I mean, I, I mean, look. The, the, the thing is, is that you know, the, the, for, form. Let's say, like, like life forms uh, have been. You know, I mean, Stefan Leduc in the end of the nineteenth century talks about what he calls synthetic biology. It's not what we understand synthetic biology now, like bio bricks and engineering. But he says, you know, I, I can demonstrate life the emergence of life, not from carbon-based things, but from chemicals moving around in Petri dishes. And so, you know, there's arguments about, um, and my, my friend Takashi Ikigami at University of Tokyo, physicist, who's also an artist, he, uh, he's interested in the question of life. And, and, you know, he says life is, you know, artificial life is not how we understand it historically as computational simulations um, like Chris Langton and Santa Fe complexity thinking, but in fact, um, artificial life is uh, is you know what are the max? He says what are the maximum conditions of life? What are li kind of living technologies? And so um, there's all sorts of things that might be qualified as 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 living systems, you know. Um, and there's certain, you know, Aristotle says the fundamental c concept is mo motion and self preservation and all all of these these concepts, you know, but it's been demonstrated that emergent systems of either chemical or biological or mathematical demonstrate some of those kind of core principles of what living systems are, ones that are able to self-organize, uh, that are able to achieve a certain degree of complexity based on simple 
parts that produce indeterminate or let's say kind of can you give an example of one of your works, present or past or future, that embodies these concepts? Yeah, like so. For instance, like I'm working on I'm working on a project with artificial intelligence for the Barbican Center, and we're having these debates. So basically, the project is a light sculpture called Totem. It's 14 meters tall. It's very very big, and it has um, it has. Um, I don't know, 4,000 LEDs on both sides, so it's 8,000 LEDs. So it's a matrix, basically. But it's covered, and it has a lens on the front of it and on, on, these, on this kind of column, and so this light doesn't look like pixels. It kind of distorts into strange shapes and looks like it has lots of depth in it. It's a very strange kind of visual distortion. And what we're doing now is we're starting to think about a kind of very fundamental question, which is, what are the different time scales of experience people will have when they encounter this thing? And there's like, the, it, that's kind of influenced by the work of late work of Francisco Varela, who talks about um, different time scales of cognition. So, you know, the brain is not working at one time scale; it's working at many, many different time scales. Um, ones that were not are not necessarily perceivable to us. So we basically said, hmm, let's see, like. How did so? This is in a public. This will be in a public space in, in the Barbican, not in a gallery. Uh, and it's a space in which a hundred thousand people walk through a month. And so we're trying to figure out, well, what are the different time scales of um, that could grab people's attention? And we watch. And this is in the. This is on a ramp in the middle of the Barbican that connects two major streets in the city of London to next to each other. So some people walk through the Barbican to get from one street to another. Some people come in the Barbican to eat lunch. That some people are coming for concerts or performances in the evening. So there's kind of constant flow of traffic. So we said, oh, let's. This is interesting. So we, we were there. We were observed. We watched people just like scientists do in experiments. And we and we made lots of detailed notes. And we thought, hmm, this is interesting. There seems to be like different time scales. How do we? So our, our interest is like, how could we use um, new kinds of learning systems like unsupervised machine learning or kind of neural models or different things? Um, how can we use them to shape a different sense of time for people, a kind of time which is self-organized by um, the machine? So you might say the machine itself has a kind of time perception uh, that meets uh, human time perception. So what we what we talked about, we haven't done it yet, but we're exploring this. Is like how do we make different time scales that work for different types of people? So like one time scale is like a minute time scale. It takes one minute for someone to walk from one end of this ramp where this work will be suspended to another end. That's if someone's not looking at the thing that they just ignore it. They're looking at their phone or they're trying to go to a lunch appointment or whatever. So like the work has to work at a one minute scale. You have to be able to perceive somehow a structure. And this is a very tall thing. So in fact, it's, it's not intimate. It's, it feels like a beacon, you know, in a, in a very busy space. But how could you perceive this one minute experience of time that might force you into a second time scale is like five or six minutes, like that it works at a different time scale. That's like if you catch somebody and they become entrained or curious or mesmerized temporally by it, like then they stay a bit longer. They're standing, they're not sitting, they're looking, they're trying to deceive, discover a pattern so and so. And then there's a much longer time scale, which is like people that are sitting upstairs in the martini bar or are sitting at a table working and then you know, looking at this thing. And they're there for one hour, two hours, whatever. So then suddenly at the one or two hour scale, this thing has to work to reveal a pattern over a long period of time, you know. So, you know, one of the debates we're, we're having is like, what is does this thing sense the environment? Is it self-organizing in the sense it just sees itself? It sees its, it sees the like the amplitude or the you know flicker rate or the frequency of the light, and then starts to run that through an algorithm and starts to try to perceive rhythm or frequency or synchrony or you know different features basically, or is it open to the environment in the sense of the environment? Um, gives it some information about 
and it doesn't know what the environment is, obviously, the machine knows nothing about anything. Um, but is it, can it detect a certain rhythmicity or pattern of people walking toward this thing and far, uh, walking away from it? And, and so how open then is the system to, to the environment? So like we're having a lot of interesting debates, like where's the border of the sensing? Like, is it at the, is it at the work itself? Is it five meters away? Is it the whole in space that it's in all, all of these kinds of things? So, so, but of course, what we we're aiming is that people kind of sense that their own, let's say, scale of perception comes into alignment or into um, becomes entrained with this alien type of time, you know, which is made possible by like a kind of machine time, you know, um, and that's a very interesting question. This is something that that people in neuroscience trying to figure out like time coding, Peter Cariani's work on time codes in the brain, like how do we synchronize uh, certain formations of neurons and the firing rates of those neurons to actually external clocks, but they are not central clocks that are distributed for instance, you know, so like music, as you know, you know, like um, it's done lots of experiments with EEG, with event potentials, looking at the spike, not just the spiking rate, but also the, the, the synchrony between different events exterior to the one's perception and then um, the way the brain interprets or, or, or let's say synchronizes with those signals. And so, you know, it's like we're moving from like the lowest level, which is like the kind of, let's say, um, temporal level at the level of neurons uh, all the way up to the highest level, which is like what happens to your perception of time if you encounter this thing, and that's like qualitative. So we have to we're going to do interviews with people and ask. In the lab, we're actually starting to we're going to start doing studies where we set up different types of rhythms and we ask people to try to describe them, to try to graph them, to try to say, well, you know, do you see a pattern? Do you not see a pattern? You know, um, and this this is aligns with the with the philosophical question, which is like. The relationship between order and disorder is something I'm really interested in, you know, which is demonstrated all the time by scientific research and scientific phenomena, right? That order and disorder are not given in systems. That actually, those, that those things emerge temporally, perceptually, uh, based on inter forms of interaction that we don't necessarily perceive, uh, and, and so on. So, you know, I think that's where you can describe like an artistic work that actually asks, it doesn't do science, but it asks scientific questions that are actually interest, that scientists themselves, like say natural scientists, neuroscientists, which are also interested in. And that's where I see a really productive discussion um, and connection uh, between an artistic work, which has its own aims, and scientific inquiry, uh, which has its own aims as well, but in fact, the set of questions that emerges between the two might actually align them. I feel we've just scratched the surface of about two-thirds of the things that I would like to discuss with you. I'm sure it's clear by now to our audience that you're someone who brings together different domains of knowledge and practice in in one vision, in one body, and at least for me, I can say in a way that I had never encountered before. I really encourage the listeners to check you out online, the incredible books you've written and all the material that you have available, if it's videos and if it's articles you've written or that have been written about your work. I will sure keep following you and hopefully we can one day resume this discussion. Thank you so much, Chris, for being on Technoculture. Sure, Federica. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast. 